Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Chit Heads. My guest today is Ian Witcher. Ian is a professor and head of the Department of Religion at the University of Manitoba in Winnipeg, Canada. He specializes in Hinduism and the yoga tradition and is the author of scholarly books and numerous articles, including The Integrity of the Yoga Darshana, which we'll talk a little bit about today, and co-editor of Yoga, the Indian Tradition. Dr. Witcher has a new book coming out soon titled Essays on the Yoga Sutra, Engaging the World in Freedom, and is currently writing another book on the yoga of intelligence, which we will also talk a little bit about today. So hello, Ian. Thanks so much for joining me. Thanks, Jacob. It's great, finally, to connect with you. Yeah, yeah. it certainly is. So I am really excited to talk to you about a kind of fresh way of looking at the Yoga Sutras, or perhaps um, maybe not fresh isn't quite the right word, but looking at it in integrity, as you, the title of your book says, or with integrity. But before we get into that conversation about the Yoga Sutras, I'd love to hear a little bit about your own personal story and kind of what has led you to the work that you do. Right. Well, let's see. Uh, it, it takes me back to undergrad years at Queen's University, and I was studying political science. Mm. Uh, my dad was a, a politician, and I thought, well, if he can do it, I can do it. And uh, anyway, uh, <laughs> as it turns out I was more interested in high energy uh, meeting folks and partying. And, uh, <laughs> experimenting and getting into music mm -hmm. and uh, essentially looking back on it I was interested in higher consciousness yeah. at the time I was not formulating that at all yeah no one's really talking about it but um, at the same time I ended up uh, getting sort of disillusioned with the studies I left university for a short time and then I started meeting certain people, just a few, who made a big difference in my life. Um, special people who uh, suggested that I might explore meditation because they seemed to recognize something in me that was right for it. So I started doing a form of TM, mm -hmm. Transcendental Meditation, with uh, uh, Maj Yogi. Uh, and uh, continued that for a few years. I re-enrolled in university in the Department of Religion at Queen's University. This is at Kingston, mm -hmm. which is a wonderful town in between Toronto and Montreal. A beautiful, beautiful university. And um, I ended up doing an honors BA in religion, specifically because that's where I could study the Eastern philosophy. Right. Not so much in the philosophy department, but in the department of religion. Yeah. So I became increasingly drawn towards mysticism and India. And uh, uh, not so much yoga, but Vedanta, mm -hmm. because Vedanta was presented as the teaching, yeah. of, uh, the highest pinnacle of Hinduism and so on. I right. also studied... Buddhism a lot too, and I got in a little bit into Sufism, but um, so I completed a, a degree there, and it went very well, and continued meditating and so on, and became more and more interested in going to India, and um, also I became uh, close, uh, not so much as an intimate friendship, but I, I did meet him and walk with him a few times with J. Krishnamurti, mm. uh, Jiddu Krishnamurti, who was a, a huge influence on my life. Um, and his, his writings, as you, as you know, uh, were um, very important, almost like cutting edge, um, challenging writings to take on board, especially if you were inclined to look to the notion of wisdom in the form of another person, mm. i.e. the guru tradition, because Krishnamurti seemed to be saying, don't follow a guru. Yeah. What he was essentially saying was, be a light to yourself, Whatever, what, however that light leads you, that's all good. But for, um, for Krishnamurti, he saw the guru tradition as a kind of a snag that where people would become overly attached to trying to follow the light of another. So in that sense, 
I was walking on an edge there because I knew I could learn from others, especially I was looking for a guru. I was looking for an enlightened being. Mm -hmm. it, it seemed like a no-brainer. <laughs> and uh, I did uh, meet Krishnamurti after a talk in Switzerland, and we walked together. Um, I ran after him, actually. Uh, uh, he, he would walk between these two villages, um, Sanan and Gustad, before he gave this talk in, in Sanan, he would walk, and then he would walk back to Gestad. So everyone was watching him walk back, and I just took off after him. <laughs> uh, and, and we walked, and, and we just ended up holding hands. And, and uh, it was a moment of transmission, mm. looking back on it, because nothing really was said but it was through the eyes and the look he gave me. And uh, that became um, a major kind of, uh, uh, how can I put it, experience. Not that he gave me anything outside, but he, yeah. he rekindled that whole sense, taking it on to a deeper level mm. of what you might call a search, but realizing that the search was never outside of yourself. Yeah. You had to include more. And uh, this, uh, then I went to India and I studied with um, someone who I met in Canada uh, who was from India named Swami Sham, who passed away a year ago. Uh, he was 92, 93 years old. He lived wow. in Kut Valley in northern India. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I, I was attracted to his teachings and I met him in the flesh. He was a very fiery, dynamic guru and um, spoke very directly to Yoga Sutra. And I was very influenced by his, um, uh, the way he would teach about the mind and about how you don't mess with the mind, you don't try and control the mind, but you allow the mind to rest in its center. Mm -hmm. And that had an influence, of course, on um, how I approached the Yoga Sutra and the central definition of yoga as Chittavritti Niroda, which is still my favorite, my favorite definition of yoga, albeit it is packed with meaning mm -hmm. and layers of understanding. So I went on to do an MA at Concordia University in Montreal on Indian philosophy and ethics and um, would continue to go back to India up to a year at a time with Swami Sham. Um, I was married in 1983 to my wife Rose, so we would travel together back to India. Um, she wasn't as enthusiastic about <laughs> who, as I was, she was an artist, so she was already seen pretty clearly, uh, <laughs> lots of credit. And um, eventually, um, I did a PhD at Cambridge because I wanted to do a, a, a thesis where I could focus on what the thesis was about. So at Oxbridge, you can just focus on research. You yeah. didn't have to get involved in coursework. They assumed that you'd done that. Right. Anyway, uh, in America and Canada, it's very different in a PhD. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I was actually accepted at Cambridge to work with a particular person who I got to know before I actually went there. His name was Julius Lipner. He's a wonderful Hinduized Catholic who grew up in India. His mother was Indian, and his father was from the original Czechoslovakia. And uh, his name is Julius Lipner, and Julius was raised in Calcutta. And he had these wonderful insights that enabled him to dialogue in a very unique and in-depth way between Christianity and uh, Hinduism especially. And his book on Ramanuja, one of the great um, Vedantins uh, was pivotal in in giving teachings on yoga as a means to the purification and illumination of consciousness. 
albeit Ramanuja was not a full-fledged non-dual Advaitin teacher. But I ended up getting accepted to do work on Vedanta, but I, but I, um, after a year, I realized that my the my heart was into Patanjali, hmm. and so I was allowed to do a thesis on Patanjali's Yoga Sutra, and so there we were living in Cambridge, and I had this time to explore the intuitions from my experiences, mm -hmm. how to bring it into to ink form on paper and try and bring what I, I call the integrity of the yoga darshana, which is bringing together the theory and practice in a way that breathes more and more life into our human embodiment. Yeah. Because yoga is for the consciousness. Wherever consciousness is, that is where yoga is located. Hmm. And the yoga wants to thread together that consciousness right through and through all the way. So how far we take it, how wisely it takes us, how we take it, that becomes yoga. Hmm. Yeah, so, so it, and it feels like this to me, but I'd love to just hear you um, express this, that, that the integrity of the Yoga Darshana was really born out of the relationship between your own scholarly work and your practice. Is that correct? Yes, absolutely, yes. So can you talk a little bit about what that looks like? And here we're talking about kind of the identity of the scholar practitioner, someone who um, is not just sort of like working with the... The, the traditional scholarly methods, but is also drawing upon this um, this practical component, which really is, as you say in the book and in your work, is really the essence of yoga, uh, classical yoga, is this marriage of theory and practice. Yes, yes. And indeed, um, of course, the theory needed some, we need to study. Yeah. Swadhyaya. And so the theory... Um, shows itself to you it's as if for many people they'll they'll look at a text like yoga sutra and what do you do with it you know, and then there's the tradition there are many commentaries and great commenters uh, on the yoga sutra uh, as you know the commentarial uh, tradition is very rich mm -hmm. um, but it's as if there is this opaqueness to the text and um, what I started to see was that I could I felt myself in that text yeah I, I was starting to feel myself in the text and connect with certain key ideas that were coming from as if some spaces within and I yeah. needed to make the connection there uh, something was just making me do that inside I felt this is what I must do making the connections between these inner spaces and the the ideas the concepts which of course in yoga all the concepts are basically spaces mm -hmm. of consciousness mm -hmm. and and how to make that connection because when you see that consciousness does include the concept then somehow uh, you can express more and more conceptually what that re those realizations are. Mm -hmm. Although you don't mistake the concept for the realization, nevertheless you can bring more and more clarity onto the level of the analysis and the investigation in the written form. And that can be very helpful for people. Yeah, yeah. Uh, indeed. So the theory there is is there to to bring um, I would call an integrity of a tradition that is continually up, up, uh, updating itself over time and needs that updating to incorporate more and more of the human uh, experience as it is happening now. Mm. And that's why the word now becomes very important in yoga, atta. Mm. Now begins the discipline of yoga. So now is a very important word 
in that yoga wants to embrace life as it is. So we need to give a context for life as it is when we approach the Yoga Sutra. Okay. Uh, it's not about it's not about some text that's frozen way back there in time where everyone had everything right. <laughs> have everything right. Yeah. And that's why there are all these wonderful teachings on how to get it how to get it right, as it were. So let's talk a little bit about the what we might diagnose as the problem that you've certainly seen and you address in your work on how many scholars and even practitioners, we might say, are are approaching the Yoga Sutra. Um, I know in your book it's a lot about how you know contemporary scholars have really um, applied a certain method that isn't uh, maybe applicable or is in some sense problematic. So can you expand on that? Yeah. So uh, as some people know, especially if you if you have um, studied, then you'll come across the um, the Sankhya school, yeah. which uh, teaches very clearly on the notions of Purusha as consciousness, or what it means is the true person, and uh, Prakriti, mm -hmm. what we might call our existence, which manifests as activity. The whole universe is, in effect, Prakriti. Right. So we begin with these two principles. So. Yoga has been associated with adopting this Sankhyan kind of dualism right. of Purusha, consciousness, and Prakriti, existence. And uh, it's as if, for many, that Sankhyan dualism was foisted onto the Yoga Sutras so that all yogic experiences then had to be fitted into this metaphysical dualism. Yeah. You and often it, hear people say even that, you know, you can consider Sankhya the metaphysical backdrop of classical yoga. I feel like that's a very common refrain. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Now, one thing that is presumed is that Sankhya itself is a dualism. Mm -hmm. It certainly uses a dualism, but it may, you know, it may in fact be pointing to a kind of dualism that needs to be purified out based on our karmic um, activity. In other words, prakriti as a karmic activity that where our sense of self is subsumed in that. Right. And that disappears at the end of the day. Therefore, even Sankhya, the karika says, prakriti is liberated at the end of the day. Well, what does it mean that prakriti is liberated? Uh, Purusha never needed to be liberated, but the result of all this is that Prakriti is liberated. So pursuing that great theme of the liberation of Prakriti, of nature, of the universe, what is it that's liberated? Then, in Yoga Sutra, um, there are far more practices given to um, to make that liberation a possibility in human life and certainly yoga is known for that in Sankhya the emphasis is on liberating knowledge on the Viveka mm -hmm. the, uh, the liberating discernment between Purusha and Prakriti so the question has to be asked in yoga um, why is that emphasis on discernment carried forth as the liberator and all forms of practice then lead to the enhancement of that discernment, that vivekyati. So what is that discernment really about? Mm -hmm. We need to ask the question, is it really about two metaphysical principles that we need to discern? Or is it about our sense of self that is has become over the top? <laughs> as Prakriti yeah. and, our, and our self, which is at base, Purusha or pure conscious being. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty clear to me that the Yoga Sutra wants to create a dialogue between non-afflicted spaces within and affliction because at the base of affliction is non-affliction. Non-afflicted qualities of mind, 
body, prakriti, are more subtler forms of the one existence. So affliction is, in a way, grosser, more, um, uh, how can we put it, tainted yeah. forms of the same existence. And we need to look at what's going on in yoga, that it's not about um, getting rid of something, but it's more about subtilizing what is already there. So this process of subtilization of the mind becomes very important, how we understand what that means in relation to practice and what is actually going on. It has tremendous psychological implications as well. And how to understand the whole ego mechanism, which is often considered to be the problem. Yeah. And we need to go into this whole sense of ego because ego is so often labeled the culprit, mm -hmm. the anti-spiritual kind of uh, devil, as it were, the thing that gets in the way and we need to, to update the teachings so that we bring more refined understanding to what the ego is and what its place is in the great scheme of yoga. And how do you? And what do you think that role is in the great scheme of yoga, the role of the ego? Well, when you go back, and, and we must go back to the tradition, not to bury things in the past, but to, um, to bring a reconsideration of the principles that are used that we know in yoga out of a kind of unmanifest essence of life springs manifestation due to the presence of consciousness. Mm -hmm. And that is called prakriti that springs forth to, to, to come forth. And so the nature of prakriti is ultimately um, the form of action. Mm -hmm dynamism, dynamic action that springs forth due to the presence of consciousness. So it begins in the form of, as it were, the subtlest aspect of life, the pure sattva, mm -hmm. pure being, literally it means, in manifestation, out of which the principle of action, or rajas, and uh, inertia and stability, or tamas, arise out of that. And these take various forms, including uh, what we can call the Mahat, or the Great One, which coincides with the principle of intelligence, or Buddhi, uh, B-U-D-D-H-I, from where Buddha originates, the term comes from the same root source, Sanskrit source. It means to be awakened, the awakened one, the Buddha. So out of this Buddhi springs the ahamkara, or what is normally understood as the principle of ego. Mm -hmm. The ahamkara has been reduced to ego in its not-so-helpful form. Right. Whereas the ahamkara has much more potential than that. It literally means the making of the I am. The aham, I am kara, the activity of I amness. Mm. And, in other words, the ego is not actually an entity, the ahamkara. Mm -hmm. It's not an entity, it's an activity. Mm. So often it's been understood as an entity that we must get rid of in order to realize our true nature. Right. That darn ego, <laughs> really, it's just so awful, without <laughs> understanding how that functions. What is the functioning of the ego? And that is where Patanjali from the beginning points out and says, what is yoga? He says yoga is the niroda or a dissolution of the chitta vritti or that uh, functioning of the mind through which our sense of self is caught. That's why he focused on the mind and its functioning, because that's where all the action was. That's where our sense of self is trying to locate itself, trying to be happy, trying to be fulfilled, trying to make the world better, and somehow can't quite get it right because 
it is in itself incomplete. So it is a sense of incompletion trying to complete itself, which is impossible. Yeah. So uh, the, the ego then is not something you have to uh, snuff out or get rid of in yoga. And I think there's a, there's a, a misconception there that the ego is the enemy mm -hmm. of the yoga. <clears throat> Whereas the ego has to be seen for what it is. And then it ceases to be something that is in the way. Ultimately, it is the functioning of the mind that we have to be educated into. Mm -hmm. that and, is, yes. And then yes. part of that illusion really is, the, is seeing the ego as an object, correct? Rather than this kind of process that yes. when refined can actually serve the process of awakening in some way. Is Indeed. that kind of, yeah. Yes. Go ahead. So the ego, the ego comes comes across as being the subject, right? And the world is the object that the ego perceives. Whereas, what the ego truly is is it is an object that mistakes itself for our true subject, mm -hmm. and therefore tries to view the world through this mistaken identity. Yeah. So no wonder we get the world wrong. We 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 can't quite make the best sense of what this world is, we ceased, we don't know what the world really is. In fact, we don't know what matter is. And the question then, does matter actually exist, I think is a good one to throw up. I think yoga has a lot to say that, that I don't even think matter has been truly discovered yet. <laughs> because the more you look at it and give subtlety to it, you realize that there's more subtler aspects. Yeah. It's like the and more the least, yeah, yes. it's like the more subatomic they go, the less they see, or the the more illogical it appears to be. So there's nothing to stand on, and that feeds nicely into the three guna doctrine of Sankhya and Yoga, which sees the universe, all manifestation, in the light of of three kind of primal constituents, mm -hmm. um, which give shape and form through the tamas through the power or dyna, dyna, dynamism of rajas, and ultimately that comes from the seeds of intelligence that, uh, out of which the rajas and tamas arise out of. So in a sense, our sense of self then, yoga is trying to put out, uh, is a, often a product of these three gunas, rather than as the one um, out of which these three gunas arise or appear to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the more we go into the yoga practice and the theory together, the more one realizes that the more sattva is located, the more of this transparent uh, lucidity of intelligence or consciousness, the more we start to see the world for what it is because we've ceased to identify ourselves as a separate self from what we're viewing. And that is the power of the sattva that the yoga practice is there to allow to take place. And that, that's a kind of a transmutation of the mind where our sense of self through its identifications has become tamasified, yes. has become inert or it's become um, over the top, uh, <laughs> energetic, anxious. Yeah. anxious. So anxiety is a, is a kind of form of excitement that is taking itself too seriously. Yeah. You see. Yeah. So the more you subtleize it, the more you realize all this stuff that appears negative is actually a modified form of what is supremely positive and life giving. And uh, so there's nothing we need uh, hide from or suppress. Rather, we need just to see it clearly for what it is. Now, that's a threat to our normal sense of self because it assumes that it's in there and it is that threat from its fears. You know, its fears may overtake it and so on. Um, I think what yoga is saying is that our sense of self is really a product of this movements within the mind where we have assumed a kind of imagined fictitious identity that is in there which isn't really there 
Yeah. yeah. Yoga is a way of gently allowing that mm. to mm. reveal itself for what it is, yeah. which is yeah. just, and therefore you, you liberate the mind from trying to be the self. Mind <laughs> gets sick of trying to be the self. It's quite right. sick and tired, I imagine, yes. Yes. So um, I have a question. I want to kind of sort of circle back a little bit and ask you um, about, you know, the relationship between Purusha and Prakriti, uh, because as it's often um, spoken about, you know, uh, as you mentioned in your work, you know, Purusha is the kind of destination of practice and this idea that we are trying to kind of get out of Prakriti and then Kaivalya is this, you know, ultimate state of realization where we're isolated in our identity as pure seer. And it's a quite, you know, as you say in your work, it's a quite sort of um, deadening kind of experience because if the world of Prakriti is the entire world of activity and we're actually looking to get out of that, then really it's this sort of like black hole <laughs> of existence. Right. It doesn't yeah. seem really very attractive. I mean, if you think about it, it doesn't, I don't want to go there. I don't want to be completely cut off from the world in my, in my Purusha state, but it's advocated as being, you know, the kind of gold mine of practice. So can you, I know we've been sort of talking around this, but can you talk a little bit about why Purusha as se- ontologically separate from Prakriti has become so central and how we can sort of look at that relationship and, and what you say in your book is more of an epistemological or maybe we could even say pedagogical way? Yes, yes, indeed. Um, there is there is a separation, as it were, uh, that must take place and, and that is... Uh, but it doesn't, it's a symptomatic of what yoga really lays emphasis on, and that is our capacity to see clearly. Mm-hmm. So Kaivalya, or the ultimate state of yoga, is nothing but the power of seeing. Mm-hmm. It's, not a, it's not a metaphysical dualism, mm-hmm. uh, per se. Uh, people can conclude that when they give a metaphysical understanding of of the sutras, yeah. that there is an ontologically superior principle or state of being um, which excludes at the end of the day uh, the whole notion of prakriti. But that seems to me to be um, an emphasis which is, is not very attractive. The practices are very appealing. Uh, so many people have taken the Yoga Sutra and say, let's take the practices and throw out the theory. Mm-hmm. What I'm trying to show is that the theory actually is so much wedded to the practices that at the end of the day, the practitioner becomes, is the theory and the practice. Yeah. Or you might say, yoga is doing all this theory and practice. You have to listen to the inner voices, the inner spaces of consciousness speaking, and that becomes the guide along the way, which is the real meaning of the guru, actually, is is the guru, far from being your inner ego, is the inner space of consciousness that comes forth and allows for greater clarity, and uh, that translates itself into much more integrity in life in the world. So um, we liberate the world, Uh, we liberate our mind and body, we liberate even the ego from this inability to see clearly. Mm -hmm. Uh, That essentially is what yoga is about and the way to that is through the very um, property that somehow um, seems to be eclipsing our vision. And that it comes through the subtilization, the purification of our own prakriti. So yoga is about educating ourselves into our own prakriti. Mm. It's not about, and therefore transcendence means to cross over from the grosser aspect of prakriti into her wonderful, subtle, luminous um, foundations and let consciousness do its thing through that. Mm -hmm. So then how can we translate the, or how can we understand the meaning of the isolation that is the translation of Kaivalya? It's not, if it's not the isolate, the actual metaphysical isolation of Purusha, then what are we isolating exactly? 
Well, it's really the aloneness of pure seeing. Mm. So um, that has been understood then as um, being part and parcel of the principle of Purusha. Uh, but both Purusha and Prakriti are necessary in order to, to, as it were, arrive in that state. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't exclude Prakriti. And in fact, Prakriti then is fully available to be experienced and seen in her true light. And that is in the light of consciousness. And that is why the Yoga Sutras culminate in the Sutra with the Chitti Shakti, Kaivalya, and the power of consciousness. Shakti having to do with, of course, energy and manifestation mm -hmm. become mm -hmm. one and the same. So Patanjali wasn't interested in creating a theory a post-enlightenment state so much and giving all kinds of uh, articulations. He wanted the practitioner to get to that state of freedom within and let the experience speak for itself. Mm -hmm. In that sense, it's a very open-ended system which can um, embrace, as I say, um, it can cross all kinds of barriers and boundaries, religious boundaries, any kind of boundary that's there to in, include all all beings mm -hmm. in that light of that yoga, and to those who think yoga is is yoga is a label yoga, <laughs> not paying attention. Chitta Vritti Niroda is yoga. You, it is a nameless, transconceptual realm, which includes all that there is. Yoga means the whole. It is the totality of all that there is. All consciousness and existence is one. So m my point is that Kaivalya then is the power of seeing which fully connects consciousness and existence. Then there is that um, liberation of Prakriti from being what she isn't. She isn't a separate self. She isn't a fractured uh, metaphysic uh, between self and world. So you're able to then liberate her and allow her to come forth, such as a kind of the goddess energy, which yeah. is with the Shiva in Tantra. Yeah. The Shiva and Shakti go together. So I, my argument is that Yoga Sutra brings one to that point, mm -hmm. that the basis of Tantra is in Yoga Sutra. Yeah. Yeah, uh, there's no point in me writing a book trying to prove it. It's just clear to me. <laughs> you know, there'll be those who disagree and those who say, "Well, fantastic, look at what what Ian's done." But that's not where I'm at. Mm -hmm. It's making the connections between these inner spaces and the conceptual realm, because ultimately the concepts are there to serve consciousness, yeah. not to mind consciousness. Yeah, language is there to embody consciousness, not to take away from the realization. So we need to reestablish that. And that, of course, is where Tantra comes in, but also yoga is there. Yoga and Tantra essentially are pointing to the same capacities mm -hmm. for life. Yeah. I'm really happy that you mentioned that about Tantra because one of the things I appreciated about um, your work when I was reading was how you mentioned how th it really the Yoga Sutras leaves open the question of kind of the non-dual, which is really what we're talking about. We're talking about Tantra, Vedanta, and and oftentimes the people that are criticizing the Yoga Sutras in some sense are are on are in this kind of non-dual camp who think that you know the sutras is dualistic and we don't need any of that. But I, I've always felt like it was it seemed progressive I'm progressive and, I, and I'm curious if you feel the same way that that there's kind of a, maybe a certain part of the path or a certain aspect of our sadhana that requires the kind of discerning um, function of the yoga sutra and and then the tantra is sort of augmenting that in some way yes yes um, so the the whole process of discernment becomes becomes obviously very crucial and uh, because it, it has to do with the capacity 
it has to do with unfolding the capacity of the mind to to be steadied in its true nature so you're you're actually giving the mind a break uh, from from being contracted yeah into what it and and therefore it will dysfunction yeah you know the dysfunctionings of the mind are the result of not harnessing the mind and so yoga speaks to the harnessing of the mind with consciousness and um, therefore there is a necessary process to discern as it were what's called the seer the inner seer of consciousness or purusha from the seen so prakriti has been called the seen or the seeable that which can be seen and experienced in order to liberate the mind from um, trying to be the self. So the self does not, or consciousness does not um, belong to Prakriti, as it were. Uh, consciousness is consciousness, and it needs to be liberated from mistaking itself for the limited forms that Prakriti takes. Mm -hmm. That has nothing to do with uh, coming down on Prakriti and saying that she is the the thing that has to be transcended in order to be liberated. What is transcended is the feel is our incapacity to see, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. ignorance then is to mistake ourselves. So ignorance is also part of the process of liberation. The great teacher Arbindo pointed out and it's there in the early Upanishads, that without ignorance, knowledge cannot do its thing. Mm -hmm. Knowledge mm -hmm. needs ignorance in order to realize itself and bring the knowledge into embodiment, onto the level of form. It isn't just about transcending form, it's about liberating form from its exclusive claim to consciousness. Mm -hmm. In other words, I exist as this form only, Although that has its own place, consciousness needs to be liberated from the exclusivity yes. of the forms in which it has taken. And I think essentially uh, it is about consciousness coming to realize itself through the form. Mm -hmm. that, that is what yoga is talking about. So ultimately what is included in that swarupa, in the true nature, of consciousness which results from the niroda in yoga where the self is abides in its true nature it can include the forms in which it takes because those forms are no longer binding consciousness to a mistaken sense of identity in other words consciousness is released at its source to come through and pervade the whole universe mm. uh, it's a wonderful thing but uh, so that is what yoga brings to the table is is essentially the the art and as it were the science of liberation mm. um, we should not be naive though <laughs> in assuming that many of the interpretations given yoga sutra have it right yes we need to update the mm. whole teachings in the light of consciousness and bring it out into a a dialogue today with non-duality yes with science and that is possible yeah. it's entirely possible uh, uh, perhaps focusing on the play of consciousness in the form of ego and the need to be able to uh, observe the functioning of the mind in the light of ego so that it presents itself to consciousness and then realize that all this that is going on within the mind in the world is arising in consciousness and then ultimately the great realization is that everything is made of that consciousness yes yeah beautiful and there is no existence separate from consciousness which points to the great uh, realizations from the Upanishads of subject of that pure existence, pure consciousness. How do you discover your existence? You discover it through the fullness of consciousness 
And the result of that is the ananda, mm -hmm. or the unbroken identity as that consciousness, mm -hmm. which is said to be, as it were, blissful, uh, which is not an emotional state per se, but it is the very nature of that identity of consciousness knowing itself everywhere. And then in that sense, the ego then becomes an agency for the expression of consciousness. Mm -hmm. The ahamkara truly serves its purpose then. Yeah. It becomes liberated from separate selfhood into an agency of freedom and fullness. Beautiful. I really love what you're saying because it's speaking to a kind of, and you speak about this kind of integration of these traditions and seeing their kind of complementarity. Do you think that there's been, um, there's a habit of dispersing, you know, in the kind of traditional scholarly way of separating and, and delineating differences that we get this kind of dispersed um, slew of traditions rather than a more integrated understanding that we might, you know, that might be complemented or, or seen more clearly through a kind of practical of, or some kind of practice to, that's integrated with that um, philosophical or engagement with these different traditions? Yes, I think in, in the art of, of making distinctions, which are necessary, right? Yeah. I have a daughter and a son. Well, <laughs> Sophia is Sophia and Christopher is Christopher. In the art of making distinctions, um, we can get lost in the uh, analysis yeah. and forget to come back to the beginning or to the source and let the voice of the source say, well, what are all these differences for? Yeah, uh, They're there to register um, different modes of one existence uh, rather than um, create fractions within the one existence which then people start believing in. Yeah. Uh, and that extends to religion, philosophy, to everything that Politics, there is. Politics, yeah. <laughs> My corporation versus yours and so on and so forth. Yeah. And as you know, um, Yoga today can be hijacked mm -hmm. uh, to serve that corporate mentality, you know, the notion of mindfulness, yep. where you can harness the mind through certain practices of yoga or, say, Buddhism or whatever, in order to bring more success to your company yeah. based on greed. That has nothing to do with what yoga is, yeah. nor Buddhism. Uh, we have to be careful then uh, not to um, uh, conflate the great yoga uh, in its various forms, including Buddhism, Jainism, and so on, with practices which can be hijacked by the sense of separate self that is trying to be happy through various means, right? Yeah. Whatever yeah. those are. Yeah. Um, and so there's a corrective necessary there to, as I say, I'll say again and again, Jacob, that we need to bring yoga more into this discourse. And I'm willing to do it more and more now. I love going into the public forum now. I see many intelligent folks who are looking for this kind of a discourse, which takes place in the moment, you know. But it's very helpful to update the 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 uh, the theoretical richness of yoga, yeah, which is wedded to the practice, and also the practices need to be reintegrated with the theory yeah. in a way that brings uh, brings um, greater clarity today. What's well, the, two questions on that. Then one, I, I I'm curious if you think that there are any satisfactory commentaries or translations of the Yoga Sutras right now in, in this kind of in the spirit of what you're talking about. Right. I, I'm, um, I'm aware that, um, and, and I, I met this head first when I first started to, to give talks in, in the academic circles yeah. that uh, thou shalt not uh, say certain things about <laughs> your sutra that I had to say. <laughs> well, I said them anyway, and I realized that there were a lot of people waiting to hear this. Mm -hmm. And yet there was also a group of uh, scholars who 
you know, just said, of course, it's, it's a metaphysical dualism and, and so on. But anyway, you get over that, you get over that quickly and move on. Why am I doing this? Mm -hmm. Why am I writing on Yoga Sutra? Because there is such a life enhancing and supporting way for people to get connected to themselves in a fuller way, which includes their psychology, their physiology, it includes their spirituality, it includes their emotional life, uh, it includes uh, intelligence, of course. Um, so there's a kind of an awakening of intelligence, as Krishnamurti talked about, the awakening of intelligence that yoga speaks to, and also a growing up in that awakening. Yeah. You know, many people awaken and then they think, based on certain experiences, they've got it and they can be a great teacher, but they have stopped growing up. Mm -hmm. And that can lead to all kinds of problems. So yoga challenges us to, um, all right, to waken up and then, oh yeah, wake up and grow in that awakening mm -hmm. and question and bring the teachings in in such a way that we're updating them and applying them. And that means in some ways we're breaking new ground today because it incorporates more and more of Prakriti, mm -hmm. not less and less of her. You know, uh, there's so many issues that come up now where we need to integrate and we need to be able to observe and non judgmentally understand the sense of otherness that is presenting itself to us in a new light. Because behind every sense of otherness we may experience is the sameness yeah. that is giving rise to that otherness and brings about the real glory of how that otherness is presenting itself. Um, yoga, how can I say it? I'm <laughs> More than excited, you are. Yeah, in in bringing this into, especially a public forum now. Yeah, uh, and the academic forum, I want to give my full appreciation to because there's nothing like training and study, and meditation. Because ultimately, meditation and study are one and the same. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So then, so then, um, to ask you more kind of pointedly about ways in which. You know, so someone who's listening, we're talking a lot about a kind of uh, rebirth of the relationship between theory and practice in a certain kind of way, and and um, the, uh, a newfound understanding of the theory enhancing the practice and vice versa. So, what are we kind of talking about? You know, just very practical question. Like, what does that look like? Am I just sitting down with the yoga sutras for a half hour, reading a couple of sutras and the commentary, and then sitting? in my meditation practice? I mean, what does that, what's the relationship look like or what does the kind of give and take look like between engagement with the theory and the practice? I think it's probably important that we continue the tradition uh, which was certainly set in India, the oral tradition of satsang. Yeah. Now, satsang uh, means a good company or the company of truth. Yeah or the company of openness, the company of self-inquiry. Um, it may necessitate someone who is in a seat and starts a dialogue going where folks are able to reflect upon things and actually start to refine yeah. in that moment. It will happen naturally because that refinement is always already there. It just needs the spaces to reveal itself. And uh, it is important, I think, to have a kind of dynamic dialogue going on, not just inside one's own head, but in a kind of community going on, because everyone needs others to learn through. That's the way we're conditioned, and it's a good conditioning in that there is such a thing as good, healthy relationships. Yeah. Our um, important uh, teachings in Yoga Sutra, which um, show that there is a, a right way to be in relationship to others that has to do with uh, more sattva, 
Mm-hmm. And so we need to explore, uh, often in conversation or through meditation. Uh, so we need good, we need more clarity on the level of what's presented to us as yoga. So in whatever way that is facilitated, some people will read a book and get connected. Yeah. And the person who writes that book may become known as a teacher and then may start to give talks because of they're known through the book. Think of Eckhart Tolle, yeah. for one who wrote The Power of Now. And in many ways, I want to give Eckhart so much credit for giving a kind of um, dialogue through that book, which helps people connect and ask questions, questioning what they have assumed to be the case about themselves yeah. and be able to work with their their own thinking processes to get beyond that. So we can also do that in the name of yoga because what Eckhart is really talking about is Chitta Vritti Niroda. Yeah, yeah. There's nothing else really going on there except understanding the processes of the mind and discerning um, what is affliction leading to dysfunction and what can bring about a right functioning of the mind. Mm-hmm. You know, the mind is waiting to be harnessed so that it can function in the light of more awareness and consciousness. Yeah. Wow. Wow, this has been fascinating. And um, I'm really loving this conversation. And But I want to kind of transition before we um, run out of time to uh, uh, some work that you're doing on the yoga of intelligence. I read in your bio that you're writing a book called The Yoga of Intelligence, and you've just been given a grant, as I understand, to really focus on this work. So, you know, segueing from, now from uh, discussion of the Yoga Sutra, how does all of what we've been talking about relate to this idea of the Yoga of Intelligence? Yes. Well, uh, just again, looking to tradition, there is the wonderful classical text called the Bhagavad Gita. Yes. Where there are different um, forms of yoga taught, and we, we know, uh, you know, of the three principal forms, the, the yoga of knowledge, the jnana yoga, mm-hmm. and the, the yoga of devotion, the bhakti yoga, and the yoga of action, karma yoga. Mm-hmm. And these are forms through which um, they have the common basis of yoga, meaning union in this sense, Union with Krishna, who is nothing but the consciousness existence itself. So the Bhagavad Gita teaches these three yogas. It also teaches on buddhi yoga, which you could call the yoga of intelligence. Mm -hmm. And there are indications in the Gita that bhakti, uh, devotion, loving devotion, knowledge and insight, jnana, and action or karma yoga actually are integrated through this principle of buddhi yoga. Mm. So that it is through the buddhi or through the intelligence coming through the mind that yoga takes place and is facilitated. So, in a sense, buddhi yoga integrates action, knowledge, and the heart devotion. Now, looking at the classical text on Yoga Sutra, for example, intelligence is associated with the constituent of Prakriti called Sattva, Mm -hmm. which is uh, one of the key terms that folks who get into yoga should become more and more acquainted with because it is their best friend. (laughs) It's always sitting there, uh, trying to make the connection to greater goodness, trying to make the connection to truth, beauty, and goodness. You know, Mm -hmm. that is the principle of sattva, or intelligence, which is the true nature of the citta, or mind. And that is called buddhi. But unfortunately, this buddhi, um, due to the exclusivity of consciousness mistaking itself for its bits and pieces, namely a separate sense of self in relation to a separate world and separate others and so on, 
this buddhi takes on other adverse qualities which cover its essential nature of intelligence. Yeah. So he ceased to harness our true buddhi. And as a result, human life becomes halved. It, it becomes a sense of lack, trying to fulfill something. Uh, in other words, our sense of self is always lacking. It's trying to become happy through fulfilling by accumulating yeah. the things of the mind, accumulating the things of the world, which is all based on a misunderstanding of self and the world, what the world is. So this in yoga of intelligence is a way, I say, it's the missing link in human life, and for that matter, life itself, because we come to see that that sattva, or that buddhi, is everywhere. Mm -hmm waiting to be located, but we have to locate it, as it were, uh, within, in order to see it without. Yeah. That beautiful intelligence is functioning everywhere, but we need to locate its own power within, in order to be able to see it. In other words, in order to see truth, you need to locate the truth within, or there is no power in order to see it without. Um, so there must be a surrender involved. So the buddhi yoga is associated with an ultimate surrender into the knowledge, into the heart, or the pure love, and into the dy dynamism of pure action itself, where it is said that that Consciousness alone, maybe in the form of, uh, of a god, or Krishna, or Shiva, or whatever form, is doing everything. Why is that doing everything? Because that alone is what exists, and everything then functions in that light. So the buddhi yoga becomes um, a key, and not that much has been done on buddhi yoga, very little. Um, there was a wonderful sage who lived in uh, 20th century uh, India, Sri Anirvan, mm -hmm. who did little work on Buddha, Buddha Yoga, and he was affiliated with the great teacher Aurobindo, who uh, lived in Pondicherry and set up the Aurobindo Ashram. And they talked a lot about uh, the notion of a kind of supermind that is nothing but the power of consciousness descending. Mm. So in other words, yoga is about ascending to that and that higher consciousness, and then that higher consciousness, as it were, embodies itself. Yes. So the whole evolution of consciousness comes through the embodiment of it, not through disembodying ourselves. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the purpose of life is to bring about more evolution of consciousness onto the level of form. So consciousness realizes and celebrates itself through more and more recognition of itself everywhere, under all circumstances. So are there any texts, I love what you're saying, are there any texts um, that you might, that we might point to where one could explore this buddhi yoga? I mean, to me, it's, it's, so, it's sounding very tantric in a lot of ways. A lot of yes. uh, the Kashmir Shaivite tradition, I feel like, speaks of something like this. But are there any other texts that you could point to for those that are interested in exploring this buddhi yoga? Or is it something that has to kind of be unpacked from a variety I, of texts? It does have to be nuanced. Yeah. And uh, as I say, I think the... the the depth, it needs a, a, a voice uh, of more breadth today. Yeah. And um, I, I encourage people, although Aurobindo was a great intellectual as well as sage, mm -hmm. his works, um, not, they're not so much on buddhi yoga, but they are about uh, showing how the principle of intelligence can come through yeah. the buddhi. Yeah. Um, so the integral yoga of Sri Aurobindo is a good text where yeah. he brings this into play. But 
part of the reason why I'm doing this, this so-called project, which isn't really a project, uh, <laughs> well, you know what I mean, <laughs> but it, it, uh, is that buddhi, uh, buddhi has been taken up by great uh, philosophers in India, but to, to bring out its implications today is, is in many ways a new kind of work. And um, my sense is that a lot of folks who have been into Buddhism, been into non-duality in any way, shape, or form, will really be excited about what yoga has to say about the buddhi and intelligence and the whole notion of what the intellect is in yoga. Yeah. Um, and this principle of sattva, which needs to be... Uh, understood more in the light of, of today and how sattva is the principle through which discernment takes place. It is the principle through which when that sattva is, as it were, purified, kaivalya takes place. That's there in Yoga Sutra 355. So there is a correlation between consciousness and our existence that is bridged through the sattva. So the buddhi yoga then becomes a great bridge kind of through enlightenment and bringing the integrity of what enlightenment can be today. Um, and uh, it's an ongoing process. It's an ever-evolving process because Prakriti is ever unfolding herself. Mm. It's a dynamic of change in the light of a... Um, a conscious being that is um, forever present. So where there is buddhi yoga, there is the yoga of presence. Yeah. Uh, a kind of yoga of presence is another way of understanding buddhi yoga, of equanimity, of total acceptance, through which a new kind of action can take place in the world that is life-affirming, and um, how can I put it? Um, uh, it just illuminates the whole field of, of, of life in the world mm. uh, and brings about solutions to problems through that. Yeah. So until we get established in that sattva, the real solutions cannot really be revealed. Yeah, yeah. Way, you know. Yeah. Wow. Well, this has been such an interesting conversation and I've gotten so excited about the Yoga Sutras. I needed that. So thank you. <laughs> I'm going to go sit down now and, and read the Yoga Sutras again with these newfound insights. So, um, Ian, where can people find out more about you and are you giving any kind of workshops or are you doing anything coming up that people might, um, you know, tune into or l want to learn more about? Well, um, I have been giving uh, public talks here in Winnipeg, and there'll be another one on May 4th. But when I go to Toronto, I intend to be giving quite a few public talks there. And I'm not, I'm not sure what yoga studios or whatever I'll connect through. That depends, obviously, on who's there. Yeah. But um, I would like, uh, I, I intend to go to, for example, the conference in. Um, San Jose on science and non-duality. Oh yeah, I was there last year. I'm I've put in to to do a, a talk on Yoga Sutra in the light of non-duality. Oh, I, I think that this is a voice that's needed to be given to Yoga yes, Sutra. Yes. And also that so many of the teachings in Yoga Sutra are there. Yeah. To to bring this out, you know, in a, in a new kind of updated manner that brings real credibility to the glory of what yoga is really about, which yoga means the whole, yeah, the totality of life. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you're going to be at Sand because I'll probably be there as well this year. So it'll be nice to connect right. with you. Yeah. I went last year and it was great. It's great fun. It's a, a wonderful collection of scholars and teachers. Yes. And this yoga of intelligence, I would like to get out to a, a wide readership. Yeah. So in other words, it's taking the depth of the teachings and bringing it out so that the general public can grasp it in some way mm -hmm. without watering down anything. 
Yeah. Um, I, I think yoga deserves, its deeper dimension deserves a voice that can reach out to others. So they realize, oh, if they say they do yoga, it's not separate from profound meditation or contemplative states, or it's not separate from doing the dishes or being married or, or in relationship or yoga alone is. That is why yoga is there ultimately. Yeah. And it's yeah. not a something. <laughs> it is the very, um, the very nature of consciousness that has often been called God yeah. or truth. Mm. beauty and goodness and uh, it is freedom and it is fullness and wholeness at the same time so yoga is about making whole in life mm. it has that capacity when we realize more who we are it can make more wholeness and goodness in the world in fact the world is made of nothing but that all right well that's a beautiful note to end on thank you so much Ian for chatting with me today well, thank you, Jake. I look forward to connecting with you soon. Yes, indeed. Thank you so much.